for joining us today for the worship service at Calvary Road Baptist Church. Our desire is to equip believers to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Calvary Road has a dynamic ministry committed to worshiping God, loving others, serving others, and inviting others.
thank you for joining us for worship today at Calvary Road. We are so glad you are here. If you were a first time visitor, we would like to say a special welcome to you. In a few moments, our ushers will stand and we ask that you raise your hand so that we can give you a visitor's card. Please take time to fill it out and after the service, exit into the lobby and go to our new welcome center where we have a gift for you. Our team members would love to meet you, answer any questions that you may have about Calvary Road and just simply love on you. Please leave your visitor's card with them and make your way to the fireplace as our pastors would love to meet you. Again, we just want to say welcome. Attention ladies, we will begin a women's summer Bible study Monday, July the 1st at 7 p.m. at the Haywood Baptist Association office. The title of the study is Seamless, Understanding the Bible as One Complete Story. It is a seven session study that covers people, places, and promises of the Bible, tying them together into the greater story of scripture. Please join Amy Borscht and Liza Hines as they lead us through the study. Sign up at the Welcome Center today. Church, we are having an outreach opportunity coming up in August. The Women's Ministry is sponsoring a Stuff the Bus Drive to provide back to school essentials for children in need in Haywood County. Please help us get started by bringing in backpacks and Stuff the Bus located at the main entrance near the Welcome Center. There will be more information to follow about this community outreach event. All right, good morning, church. I just want to let everyone know that if you ordered a shirt for our fundraiser with Operation Christmas Child, they'll be in the lobby this morning. Also, thank you for everybody that came out and participated in our ice cream social. We raised over $685 for Operation Christmas Child. We will be doing another ice cream social on July 17th for all who would like to participate. We will be having a baptismal service Sunday, July the 14th. If you would like to follow up in Believer's Baptism, please call our church office to be placed on the list. Good morning. I'm Laura Early, the facilitator for the Missions and Bible Study Group called BYW. I just want to take a moment and tell you who BYW is and what we do. BYW meets monthly throughout the entire year on the second Friday night of the month at 6.30. We meet at different ladies' homes each month. During these meetings, we fellowship with each other while enjoying food, Bible study, and making plans for mission projects in our area. We are called Baptist Young Women, but we have always believed we are available to women of all ages. Currently, we are in a study by Priscilla Schreier called Fervent. We are learning how to pray fervently for each other, our church, and for our individual needs. If you are looking for a group to get involved in, we are more than happy to have you join us. Check the bulletin for information about our group, see me, or find us on Facebook at Calvary Road Baptist Church, Baptist Young Women. Get involved today. Nursery is available for children up to two years of age. If you exit the main sanctuary doors, the nursery will be just to the left. If you have children ages two to four, we have a We Worship program. There will be a point during the service that we will announce that it is time for We Worship. Workers will be holding up We Worship signs. Parents, please follow them to the We Worship room to drop your children off. Also, if you would like to assist in our nursery, there's a sign up available at the nursery. If you have any questions, please see Connie Cooper. begin tonight at 6 p.m. Parents, you can still pre-register your child. Just see the ladies in the lobby after the service. Use our mobile app or go to our web page. We are looking forward to an exciting time of worship, deeper dive into God's Word and fellowship. Be sure to be in prayer for our children and workers this week. It just, yeah. it just keeps getting better, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> We are excited about today. We're certainly glad that you're here. Um, we're looking forward to a great time of worship this morning. And uh, we're excited about uh, Brother Tim Lee being with us to bring the message. And uh, we've certainly been praying for this moment this morning as he'll come in just a little bit and bring the word to us. And uh, we're just delighted that you're here. If you're visiting with us for the very first time this morning, if you wouldn't care just to raise your hand, 
Our ushers have some information they'd like to get into your hands. You can take your time filling that out. And then uh, as the offering plate comes through, uh, you can drop it in that, or you can take it out to uh, the fireplace area. There is a little bit of a difference this morning. We have uh, Brother Tim's table set up out there, and he'll share a little bit about that in a little while. Uh, but we'll be out there. If you'd like to speak to us, you can certainly bring those cards out there to us at the conclusion of this morning's service. And so I know our, our ushers are busy handing those cards out. Calvary Road, can we give a hand to all of our visitors this morning? And as you saw on the videos, we're excited about Bible school tonight. This skunk wrangler and the cat tamer over there. Pretty sure they got those pictures mixed up, though. I mean, I, I, that's just personal opinion, I guess. But uh, we're excited about Bible school starting tonight. So be in prayer for all of our kiddos that will be here tonight and also all of our workers throughout the week. And uh, let's join together now as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the day that you've given us, God, the fact that the sun is shining and, Father, you're on the throne. God, we celebrate that today. Uh, you're in charge. You're in control. And, Father, we look to you today. We trust you completely and totally. And we thank you for giving us the privilege to meet together today to lift up the high and holy name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the privilege to come into your house and to worship you and Father, I pray that as we do that today, God, that we would, uh, would literally allow the, the praises uh, from our lips, God, to just ascend uh, high into heaven, God, thanking you for who you are and what you've done for us. And then, Father, we thank you for the privilege to be able to worship you through the giving of tithes and offerings. And Father, I pray that as we do that this morning, that we would do so with heaven in mind, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. We love you today, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you will do in this service this morning. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.
When a person receives Jesus as their Savior and Lord, it doesn't take very long for them to realize that they've entered into a battle. It's a war with a fierce enemy who is relentless in his pursuit. Many of us bear the scars of what seems to be a never-ending conflict. To every Christian soldier who's ever grown weary from the battle, let me remind you that Jesus is your captain. And with God by your side, you will never fail. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't retreat. Stay faithful to your post and soldier on. can even come from those that we love and trust the most. But still, we must soldier on. Someone you trusted betrayed your soul. It seems the pain will never go. difficult moments is when that loved one who's fought alongside you goes home.
My country tends to be. My country. Good morning, good morning. We are extremely excited about this morning. Amen. Amen. And I can tell you got the word out. I can tell you invited people. Good to see the house packed this morning. This has kind of been one of those weeks that uh, I can honestly say I am absolutely uh, honored during this whole week to be able to stand next to and with families who have fought so valiantly for this country. And uh, we lost a great one this week, and Al Leatherwood, he's home with Jesus today. And I see Miss Darlene back there. We love you. We're praying for you. And uh, he trained many to fly. And uh, we have a Marine in the house today. Any Marines in here? Uh, yeah, there, there, there's some. He, uh, he asked me this morning to get a Marine to carry his chair up here. He, he said it would take a Marine. Well, I got Mark. His dad was a Marine. He said that was close enough. Uh, so we are absolutely thrilled. Here is one that gave a lot for this country, and I am so thankful this morning that he's not only done that, but he's given his service to the Lord. And many have come to know Christ through this man and his preaching. I believe you're in for a great treat today. Calvary Road, would you please make welcome uh, Evangelist Tim Lee with us today. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You may be seated. It is so uh, exciting to be here with you today, and uh, thank you for that introduction, Pastor, and for all the great uh, singing this morning, great time of, of worship, honoring our God and our country. We get ready to celebrate our nation's uh, birthday uh, here in just a few days, and so I'm honored to be here. I was, uh, my wife and I was talking, we were in Maggie Valley years and years and years and years and years ago, eons and eons and light years ago, <laughs> way back when nobody had any fun. <laughs> um, so it was been about 1980 or 1981, was it before that? Was we still pastoring at that time? Oh, wow. It was even before that. We really, that, that's a long time. Our son had only been one or two years old. We came to Maggie Valley, and I spoke in Cherokee. Don't ask me where. Does anybody remember ever hearing me speak in Cherokee in 1976, 77, 78? Y'all old, too? <laughs> Nobody remembers it. And... Uh, but I do remember one thing about where we, where we were at. I believe it was Maggie Valley. They had, a, they had a Ferris wheel up on a hill. And you could go over and you could see forever. Does anybody remember that Ferris wheel? 
Oh, you remember Ferris wheel, but you wouldn't remember me. <laughs> I'm just teasing, of course, but that was a long time ago, and we're honored to be back here today. My wife is with me. Connie, would you stand up and turn around, let the folks meet you. That's my wife, Connie. And uh, <laughs> we have uh, now been married for 47 years, and... Uh, we have three children, Brian and Jana and Amber, all three of them love the Lord. All three of them have grown up and they all three left home, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Somebody said the American dream is to own your own home. I said the American dream is to get your kids out of your home. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. Our good friend Rick from... Uh, Trinity Baptist in Asheville sitting down here. We'll raise your hand, Brother Rick. Vietnam veteran and uh, is fighting cancer, has Agent Orange, and uh, pray for Brother Rick if you would. Appreciate that. Been a supporter of our ministry. Where's the Gary, where's Gary and Judy Byram at? Right back here, Brother Gary and Judy. I've known these people probably about the time we came to Maggie Valley. Might have been about the time we met them. Uh, he was uh, up in Peoria, Illinois, and sold me a couple buses. He ripped me off is what he did. <laughs> and, uh, but we, uh, we got to know each other and I had him come and speak for me in uh, Southern Illinois where I pastored. And when I went in evangelism, I spoke for him in, was it Bradenton? Bradenton, Florida. Had a great church there, pastored a great church, wonderful a church there in Bradenton. And so I've known these people for a long, long time, special people, and I appreciate uh, you and Brother Gary, you and Judy, and your faithfulness for all these years to the Lord. Take your Bibles, if you would, to the book of the Revelation, chapter number 12. <clears throat> While you're turning to Revelation, chapter 12, let me... Uh, do something that I've been doing at all of our meetings and crusades for the last two and a half years. And one of the things that I'm going to tell you about is so exciting. Uh, some of you are going to be so fired up and so pumped up and excited uh, when I tell you this. And then the other thing is very sad, very tragic. But there's a reason why I'm telling you both of them and I'm telling you together. On January the 7th, of uh, 2017, our oldest granddaughter, Emma Nicole, and I were flying to Jacksonville, Florida, where once we got to Jacksonville, we were to go get our rental car, and then we would drive to Beaufort, uh, South Carolina, uh, where on Sunday morning I would speak to about 3,000 uh, Marines and Marine recruits. If you're going to be a United States Marine, enlisted Marine, you're either for boot camp, you go to one of two places. You either go to MCRD uh, Paris Island or MCRD San Diego. Normally, it depends on which side of the Mississippi River you're from. And uh, I had a chaplain call me several years ago uh, by the name of Steve Benefield. When he was only 17 years old, he heard me speak at uh, Grace Baptist Church in St. Charles, Missouri. And he uh, was 17 years old. He was out of the will of God. He was running from God. He got his life right with God. God called him to ministry to preach. He became a chaplain in the United States Navy. And, and he was at Paris Island serving as a chaplain. He asked me if I would be interested in coming and speaking to the recruits at Paris Island. Of course, I was interested. That's where I did my boot camp in 1969. And, uh, but I've been to a lot of military bases over the years here at home and overseas, but most of the times they're what I call a gratuitous uh, invitation. They want me to come and talk for 10 minutes and then give me an award or a plaque or something. And I'm not totally against that, but the older I get, the less appeal of those things have for me. Truthfully, I just want to see people get saved. I want to see lives change. And he assured me that that was not what this was. This is what they call Sunday morning Protestant chapel. We would have an hour and a half to two hours 
without any restrictions. I said, I don't get that kind of liberty in some Baptist churches I go to. <laughs> For real. And uh, so uh, they went through all the channels. They had to get it approved. It's a closed base. You, you can't, can't just go on the base. If your son or daughter's there, you go graduation when they graduate. But it's a closed base. And they have their own chaplains. They're very territorial. They don't let outsiders come in and speak. And so it's very unusual. So they went through the process to get it set up for me to come. The last hurdle uh, for me to come was the CO of the base had to sign off on me coming to speak. For the first time in the history of Paris Island, 100 years old, they had a female commanding officer, uh, Brigadier General Lloyd Reynolds. Uh, she's about six foot four. I'm not kidding you. And she looks like a Marine. And I'm not kidding you. <laughs> and um, she, she was raised a Catholic her entire life. About nine years ago, she was invited to a ladies' Bible study. And they were studying the Gospel of John. And this is her testimony. For the first time in her life, she understood what the Gospel was. And she got saved. So now she's in a position to make the decision whether I'm going to come and speak at Paris Island. God's timing is always right. They showed her a DVD of me speaking at Prestonwood Baptist Church in Dallas. They said she had tears running down her face and said, yes, our recruits need to hear him. We've now been to Paris Island 26 times. We go... You haven't heard the good part yet. <laughs> we go every 12 to 13 weeks. Every time we go, it's a brand new recruit class. We were there in May. We will be back in August. When we are there in August, no one will be there that was there in May. Our low numbers will be around 2,000. A high number would have been probably 4,500. We average about 3,000, 3,200. We bring in a worship team from Jacksonville, Florida. Trinity Baptist Church runs about 2,200, 2,300. And they don't send the backup players and the backup singers. They send their best. Mark Ivey, one of the great worship leaders of our day, comes and they lead in worship and praise for 45 to 50 minutes. And I want to tell you something. It's the most unbelievable thing. My wife would tell you. I just sit there and cry. You hear 3,000 Marine recruits singing God's Not Dead, it'll put goosebumps on top of your goosebumps. And they sing from their heart. And then I get up and give my story, and then I give a clear, concise presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I give a public invitation for people to come to Christ. I told them, I didn't, I'm an evangelist. If you have me come to your church, I said, what I do, I give an invitation. The last thing God did in this book was give an invitation. And, the last, and so I told him, I said, I can't see coming and doing all this stuff if we don't give them an opportunity to respond. And they assured me that we could. We do. And some of you are not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. I get a little weary about numbers myself sometimes because we hear the exaggeration and people blow them out of proportion. Somebody asked me the other day, said, you believe God's interested in numbers? I said, well, I guess he is. He wrote a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. <laughs> but in 26 events that we've now done at Paris Island, in three events that we've done at MCRD San Diego, we've seen conservatively, there are several chaplains would tell you the number's a lot higher than what I'm about to tell you, but conservatively, over 27,000 Marines and Marine recruits get out of their seats and come and give their hearts to Jesus Christ. They come with brokenness. They come with tears. They come with conviction. When we were there in May, when I had them go back to the seat, it's a concrete floor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not exaggerating. There was wet spots all over, all over that floor. Not just a handful, not just a few, all over. People weeping their way to Jesus, brokenness and conviction. We'll be back. We'll be back two more times this year. We'll be back five more times next year. 
way the year is laid out. We'll be back four more times in 21 and four more times in 22, and they're telling me that I can do it as long as we want to do it. It's a God thing. How in the world can we do something like this in a day when everything seems to be upside down? Good is called evil, and evil is called good. ACLU and Christians being attacked on all sides. No one is made to come and hear me. It's all voluntarily. They have no one's required. The only other option they have is to stay in squad bay with a drill instructor. <laughs> so they've kind of got that figured out. When Em and I landed in Jacksonville on January 7, 2017, we turned on our phone before we got to the gate and they began to light up. And we soon got the tragic news that Emma's two younger sisters, Allie, who was 16, Sarah Beth, who was 13 at the time, had been a horrible ATV accident. Another young lady was driving. They were not on the road. They were not on the shoulder of the road. They were in the grass, but a pickup truck, a man driving 70, 75 miles an hour left the road, left the shoulder of the road and plowed into the back of their ATV. And our 16-year-old Allie was killed instantly. And um, so that song you sang, Soldier On, when you've lost a loved one, been a hard two and a half years for our family. Allie, uh, Sarah Beth, they had to be cut out of the vehicle. They had to fly, uh, fly her to Fort Worth. She, we call her a miracle girl. She truly is a miracle girl. She was last year of school, played the full season of volleyball, the full season of basketball. But Allie was the most unusual 16-year-old girl. She, she loved God. She, she was uh, so beautiful. She was super smart. She never got that from her papa. She, she was beautiful. She was uh, a straight-A student. She was athletic. She nearly always the highest scorer on her team. She would never tell you that. And, uh, but more important than all that, teenagers, was she loved God. She didn't just talk about loving God. She loved God. She was a soul winner. She would witness to people. She'd talk to people about Jesus. She loved people. She hated bullies. She'd stand up for those that nobody else would stand up for. And uh, we know we'll see her again. I, I don't doubt that one ounce. We'll see her again. We have that assurance. We have a hope that the world does not have. But we still miss her. And it still hurts. If you're a mom and dad or a grandma and grandpa and you've lost a son or daughter, a grandson or a granddaughter, you know and you understand. So please pray for those two things. Pray for our marine events. It's so important. There's nothing else like it going on in our country when I'm, with our military anywhere at all to this degree. Nothing. It's a God thing. Only God could put it together. And then pray for our family. And Allie's um, you know, at, at her visitation, over 2,500 people came to her, her funeral. There was over 1,500 people came to her funeral. The, over 22,000 watched online. Her mom and dad wanted me to give the gospel and give an invitation. 267 people invited Jesus into their life at Allie's funeral. She was still having an impact and an influence. What's your story? What's your testimony today? When you go out to the cemetery and you see the headstone, there's enough information. We know something about the person that's buried in that spot. We know their name. And then maybe there's something about their military career, or maybe their family, or maybe a favorite Bible verse. But then there's always the dates. There's the date that the person was born. And there's the date that the person died. And ladies and gentlemen, young people, more important than the two dates. In between the dates is a little dash, and it's what's on your dash that's your story. What happened from the time that you took your first breath until the time that you took your last breath, that's your testimony. That's your story. I hold in my hand this morning a book of stories all through this Bible. It all started with Adam. Did you men ever stop to think what it would have been like to have been Adam? Adam had a wife and never had a mother-in-law. I 
That's a story. And Adam had a story. Noah had a story. And Abraham had a story. Moses and Joshua and David and Joseph and Daniel and Shadrach and Nehemiah and Jonah and Stephen and Paul and Peter, all of them. Matter of fact, there's a whole chapter in the book of, of Hebrews we oftentimes refer to as the faith chapter. And there's one man after the other listed in that chapter because of their faith story, their faith testimony. But then right in the middle of all those men, there's a woman by the name of Rahab. Do you know what Rahab was? Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab was a harlot. And yet there comes a day in her life when she too puts her faith and her trust in God. And God thinks so much of her faith that he puts her in the faith chapter. I'm talking to someone this morning and you've blown it and you've messed up and you've shipwrecked. And you're saying there's no way for me to have a story, to have a testimony. But I'm telling you because you're in this building right now and you're breathing air, there's hope for you. My God is a God of a second chance and sometimes a third and sometimes even more. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Listen to these words. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. And neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now the question is, how would they overcome the accuser? And the better question is for you and I today, on June 23rd, 2019, how are we going to overcome this accuser? The very next verse tells us how we're to overcome. Here it is. Are you ready? And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I was raised in a pastor's home. My dad was a Southern Baptist pastor for almost 60 years. He lacked a few months being six full decades of pastoring and preaching God's word. My mom went to heaven recently at the age of 94. She didn't really get old till she was about 92. I know some of you doesn't make sense, but she was still mowing her yard when she was 91 with a push mower, not the kind you push the handle down and it takes off. I'm talking about a push mower at 91. And she called me one day, said, I sold my car to him. I said, why, Mom, why did you sell your car? She said, I'm 91. I've never had an accident. I've never had a ticket. I don't want to go out on top. <laughs> I couldn't say that when I was 17 years old. But there were five of us kids, and let me tell you something about our home. It was not a perfect home, but no stretch of the imagination, but it was a great home. Now, you know what you do when you're raised in a pastor's home? You go to church. You go to church a lot. We went to church all the time, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival, vacation Bible school. We went to church all of the time. And you want to know something? It was good for us. We, we went to church. We were taught good things at church. We were taught uh, things in Sunday school. We were taught things from the pulpit. But let me tell you something else. This is even important. As important, we were taught things at home. Our mom and dad taught us things at home. We were taught that the Bible was the Word of God. Our parents taught us that. We were taught that there's only one true and living God, and that's the God of this Bible. We were taught that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We were taught that there's not a whole lot of ways to go to heaven. There's not a Hindu way. There's not a Buddha way. There's not a Muslim way. There's not even a Baptist way. It's a Jesus way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We were taught these things in our home. There's a lot of young adult parents in the building today. I want you to listen to these words, especially the young adult parents. Listen to this. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Here it is. Verse number seven. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, 
And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, what are you talking about? The word of God. When are you talking about it? When you sit down, when you rise up, when you go by the way. And who are you talking about it to? To your children. Hey, as important as it is for your children to be in Sunday school, and that is important, or even a WANA program, or, or even a Christian academy, all that's great and all that's wonderful, but listen to this, it's not their primary responsibility to teach your children the Word of God. It is your responsibility to teach your children the Word of God. And that is the kind of home that I was raised in when I was only 10 years of age. North City Baptist Church, North City, Illinois, Sunday morning, sat in on the second row on the right-hand side. My dad was up preaching for the first time that I could remember. I got under conviction. Now, I don't know whether you understand conviction, but the best that I can explain it to you is in a sentence or so. It's when God himself comes to you and begins to speak to you personally about big stuff like life, and death, and heaven, and hell, and eternity. And man, when conviction comes, and, and God is speaking to you, especially if you're in church, you're probably the most miserable person in the building. You would like for that preacher just to shut up. No more singing. Somebody help get me out of this building. But friend, listen, if conviction was to come to you today in this service, do you know what you ought to do? You ought to thank God for it. You know what that means? It means God loves you. It means God is trying to draw you unto himself. It means this one true and living God wants to have a personal relationship with you. Listen to this. It means God wants you to spend all of eternity with him in this beautiful place call heaven and that morning conviction came man I was miserable when the invitation started I was even more miserable all I could see was hell and somebody said well you shouldn't get saved just to stay out of hell maybe not but that's not a bad reason to get saved and I left my seat that morning during the invitation knelt to the altar my mom came and knelt beside me as a 10-year-old boy. I repented of my sins, received Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I got born into the family of God. And I'm here to tell you today, ladies and gentlemen, young people, that is the greatest and most important thing that has ever happened in my life. And if you've been saved, that is the greatest and most important thing that has ever happened in your life. i got to be up front with you today. If you've never been saved, then your life is incomplete. You may be the richest person in this building right now, but if you don't know Jesus, your life is incomplete. You may be the most educated. You may be the smartest person in this room right now, but if you don't know Jesus, your life is incomplete. You may be the strongest man in this county, but if you don't know Jesus, your life is incomplete. You may be the most beautiful woman in this county, but if you don't know Jesus, your life is incomplete. Today, you need Jesus. I was so excited. Told families and friends that what had happened in my life, but then when I became a teenager, something else happened. It never happened overnight, but gradually I began to put things before God football. Basketball, baseball, track and field, these things soon became my gods. And my dad told me more than one time, Tim, there's nothing wrong with you playing ball unless you put it before God. And then it's wrong. Well, I want to listen to that. And little by little, putting these things before God in my life, I begin to have problems. I begin to rebel. I rebelled at school. I rebelled uh, against God. I rebelled against mom and dad. You say, well, Tim, what did your parents do when you rebelled? Well, they had never read any Dr. Spock's books on child psychology. Dr. Spock believed that if a child was frustrated, whatever it took to get the frustration out, let him do it. If he wanted to pick up a rock and throw it through the window, if that would help him get his frustration out, let him throw the rock through the window. Well, my dad had other ways of getting that frustration out. We lived on a farm for a while, and behind the farmhouse was a willow tree. Now, I don't know whether you know what willow trees are good for or not, but you don't get any fruit off of them. They're not even a good shade tree. 
The only thing they're good for is to get a switch off of. And the only praying I did back then was for that tree to die, and it never did die. <laughs> I'd have to go out and get my own switch. I'd be hurting before I got back because I knew what was about to happen, and they would always, they'd always talk to us before they spanked us, and they'd say something like this. They'd say, now, Tim, this is going to hurt me a whole lot worse than it's going to hurt you. I thought, isn't that dumb? If you'll give me that switch, I'll show you it's going to hurt the world. <laughs> I said many times, even before I joined the Marines, that I served under the stars and the stripes. My dad furnished the stripes, and I saw the stars. <laughs> but they believed in old-fashioned discipline. But many times, I would slip out behind their back to do what I wanted to do. I attended public school. Most of my friends were not saved. Most of their parents were not Christians. And I made up my mind as a teenager that I could live my own life. My junior year in high school, I set records in the long jump, in the hurdles, winning ribbons and trophies, but all the time getting further and further away from God. You say, Tim, what did God do? God declares in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, as many as I love. Let me say those words one more time. As many as I love. This is God speaking. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Five of my high school friends were killed in car wrecks. Every time I'd see one of them in a casket, I knew that it very easily could have been me. God would speak to my heart, but I wouldn't listen. I kept running. I kept rebelling. I graduated from high school, started college the day, working nights. In the meantime, my life became one disaster after the other, and I didn't think it could get any worse. But it wasn't long till I got fired from my job. I got kicked out of college. Nowhere to go, nothing to do, and again, my life full of confusion. Walking down the street in my hometown, McLeansboro, Illinois, I went by the post office and I noticed a sign. I had seen the sign before, but it never got my attention like it did that day. It was a picture of a young man in a sharp-looking uniform. And at the top of the sign, it said, the Marines are looking for a few good men. I was so full of myself and so egotistical, I went into the recruiter's office and actually told them that I have found one of what you all are looking for. Now, young people, to be real frank with you, I was tired of living at home. I wanted to change. I wanted something different. I was tired of being told what time to go to bed and what time to get out of bed and how to get my hair cut and what I could do and could not do, so I joined the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> it wasn't the most intelligent thing I ever did. They put me on a Greyhound bus, sent me to Paris Island, South Carolina. I got off and stepped those yellow footprints. I met the guy they called drill instructor. Man, I was there less than 24 hours when I decided I didn't like him and he didn't like me. But you know the real reason why I didn't like him? He was in authority, and I didn't like authority. I was rebellious toward all authority, but I was soon to discover that no matter where I would ever be in this life, there would always be authority with God being the supreme in all authority. I laid awake nights, many nights, platoon 305, thinking about my life, the shame and the disgrace that I brought to my dad's ministry to my own family. My attitude began to change in boot camp. The Marines had some things to help it change. I graduated from boot camp with a meritorious promotion, private to private, first class. Went to ITR, then to engineering school at Camp Lejeune, graduated with another meritorious promotion, private first class to Lance Corporal. And then I received my orders that I was to go to South Vietnam. I had three weeks leave. I went home to Illinois and spent those three weeks with mom and dad. On Sunday, before I was to leave on Monday, I went to church with my parents and in the service that morning, I thought that I'd made things right with God. And on Monday, mom and dad drove me to St. Louis and I got on that plane that no more got off the runway. I told God that I couldn't do it. Those men were Marines. I was afraid they'd laugh at me. I was afraid they'd make fun of me. Went to Vietnam, was there for nine months. And I didn't go back to doing a lot of the things that I had done before, but friend, listen, if you're not for the Lord, 
then you're against him. For the believer, for the Christian in this building today, there is no middle ground. Today, you're either helping the cause of Christ or you're hurting the cause of Christ. I had opportunity after opportunity to live for God. Mom sent me a Bible. On the inside of that Bible, she wrote these words, Tim, this Bible can keep you from sin. Well, sin can keep you from this Bible. I put it in the bottom of my footlocker. I had no prayer life. I had no testimony. There was a black Marine in my squad by the name of Lee Gore. Lee and I flew to Vietnam on the same plane. We were the best of friends. He was a Christian living for God. I was saved, but I was running from God. Many times I'd seen him sit down to Edger's rack and read his Bible, openly witness and talk to other Marines about the Lord. And I knew this was the story. I knew this was the life. I knew this was the testimony that I was supposed to have. But I wouldn't do it. I kept running. 30 days left in Nam. My top sergeant offered me a desk job. A desk job was coveted. It meant that you didn't have to go back out to the field or the bush anymore. But for some reason, I told him that I'd rather spend the rest of my time with my own men. I was told to take them on a mine sweep. I've been on numerous mine sweeps. The only thing particularly different about this one, several of my men were new in Vietnam. Some of them had only been there a few weeks, a couple just a few days. I got my men together early that morning, March the 8th, 1971. I told my men that day that I would walk Point. Point man was the first man in the squad. 15, 20 meters at another Marine. 15, 20 meters at another Marine. And we'd be staggered out in that kind of formation. Normally, I would have been in the back of the squad with the radioman, the corpsman, the lieutenant. Not trying to be a hero or anything like that. Simply showing my men how to walk point. Our job is locate landmines and rounds that had not yet been detonated and to clear the area of those devices. We walked that morning without any trouble. We found a couple of rounds. We detonated them. We stopped at noon hour to eat. And while I was eating, my friend, Lee Gore, asked me if I wanted him to take over his point. He could have very easily have done it. He was as well trained as I. But for some reason, I told him I would finish out the day. And then tomorrow, he could walk point. We picked up where we left off from. And 45 minutes later, I stepped on a 60-pound mine. It blew me several feet into the air. It ripped both of my legs off of my body. I should have been killed instantly. It was a big enough mine to destroy a jeep. We had entered a major minefield. At the exact moment that I stepped on a mine, a South Korean Marine that was serving with us stepped on a mine as well, lost one of his legs. Our bulldozer driver set his blade down on a mine. And now there's noise and smoke and chaos and confusion. And I'm in extreme pain. I was only unconscious for a couple of moments. I realized that I had been hit. I didn't know how serious it was, but I looked up in the midst of all that chaos and confusion. In the midst of my pain, my head was laying in the lap of Corporal Lee Gore. Lee wasn't cussing the president or the communists or the Vietnamese or no one else. But rather with tears streaming down his face openly out loud, praying and asking God to help me. And I can remember today as though it happened five minutes ago, Quang Nam province, a little after 1.30 in the afternoon, I looked up that day, and I made God a promise. It was something like these simple words, God, if you'll let me live, and get back home to mom and dad, I'll do with my life what you want me to do. Well, I'd made so many promises to God on so many other occasions, but I never meant it like a minute that day. They came with a medevac chopper, carried me to the hospital ship, the USS Sanctuary. Second day I was on that ship, two naval doctors gave up hope. Infection had set in, high degree temperature, so many complications. Dr. Robert Bailey was one of those two doctors. He and I were reunited in Garland, Texas. He told the congregation of about a thousand that evening that they did not expect me to live because of the seriousness of my wounds. But God had a plan for my life. I lay on the hospital ship for two weeks, unconscious most of the time. They took me to the island of Guam, to the naval hospital where I spent the next two weeks, 
unconscious most of that time. I weighed 187 pounds before I was hit. The island of Guam, I weighed a little less than 80 pounds. During that first full week period, mom and dad received visits from the Marines, the Red Cross, and numerous telegrams and from all that they had been told. They never expected to see the oldest son alive again. But God had a plan for my life. I was speaking in Dayton, Ohio, Faith Baptist Church several years ago. Earl Lewis came to that crusade. Earl was the fifth man back on the mine sweep that day. He'd only been in Nam for six weeks. He told Connie and I that it looked like someone had taken a five-gallon bucket of red paint and just poured it all over me. He said not a one of my men thought that I would live. In that crusade, Earl gave his heart to Jesus Christ and now is a faithful member of that church. God had a plan for my life. In Danville, Virginia, Ray Birchie came to hear me. Ray was the radio man on the mine sweep that day. He told my family, my, was with me in Danville that day, he told my family that when they put me on the medevac chopper to go to the hospital ship, which is only a 20-minute flight, that not a one of my men expected me to be alive by the time we reached the ship. But God had a plan for my life. A year and a half ago, Ray came to hear me a second time in Warren, Ohio, in the second service, when the invitation was given, he was the first out of into the island, came that morning and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. God had a plan for my life. They brought me back to the States, to the Philadelphia Naval Hospital, where I spent the next eight months, eight long months, 13 major operations. When the doctors were through and all the surgeries were over. I had three inches remaining on my right leg, 11 inches on my left, but no other part of my body was hurt. And some today would tell us that it was nothing more than an accident. But I remind you, friend, that with God, there are no accidents. God was not asleep on March the 8th, 1971. You see, as a 10-year-old boy, I said yes to Jesus. But as a teenager, I decided that I could live my own life. And I made a choice, a deliberate choice to run. And I ran and ran and ran until March the 8th, 1971 when the running was over. I went home from the hospital to my dad's church in Southern Illinois. I went forward and publicly made things right. It was in that church that I met Connie. We fell in love with each other and were soon married. It wasn't long after we were married that God called me to preach. Friends and even relatives tried to discourage me. They said, be so hard, so difficult in a wheelchair. But I said, if that's what God wants me to do, that's what I'll do. I pastored for five years in southern Illinois. Now I'm my 41st year as an evangelist. I've had the privilege to speak in every state, with the exception of North Dakota. I don't even think anybody lives up there anymore. And, <laughs> and many, many foreign countries preaching God's word. And I'm going to tell you now, like I've said so many times, the past 48 plus years of my life have absolutely been the happiest years of my life. You said, but Tim, you're in a wheelchair. Your legs are gone. You told us about Allie, yes. But the difference this morning is that I'm in the will of God. And my friend, that is what makes all of the difference in the world. Here's how the book of Job says that. Job chapter 5, verse 17. Listen to this. Happy is the man whom God corrected. Wow. Tim, are you telling us that God would do something like that to a person? God doesn't necessarily do things to us. He does things for us because he loves us, because he cares for us, because we are his children. You're saved, but you're out of the will of God. I plead with you. I beg you today, don't leave the doors of this building until you make it right with God. And there may be a great number Listen to my voice right now, and you've never been saved. Your life has never, ever been changed by the power of God. You have been tremendous to speak to here this morning. And there's only been a couple of moving around. They had little babies and had to, and I understand that. But I want to ask that no one move now unless it's an emergency. If it's an emergency, we understand. And here's the reason why. I'm getting ready to say the most important words that I would have said here today. And if it was your dad or your mom or your brother, your sister, or a friend that was about to get saved, hear the gospel, maybe for the first time, maybe for like the, like the uh, Brigadier General, Lloyd Reynolds, maybe understanding the gospel for the first time, it's going to happen here today. 
And if it was your friend, you would want people to pay attention to. So here it is. The most important words. A little over 2,000 years ago, God sent his only son to this earth. God didn't have 20 sons. God didn't have two sons. God had one son, Jesus Christ. He came to this earth born of a virgin. And he lived here on this earth. God's only son lived here on this earth for nearly 33 sinless, spotless years. He did no wrong. He is the only person to ever live on this earth a sinless life. That was Jesus, the only one ever. And then one day, he walked up Calvary's hill, willingly, laid down his life for your sins and for my sins and for the sins of the world. He hung on a cross suspended between heaven and earth. And on that cross, he shed his blood. And on that cross, he died. God's only son died. They took him off of the cross and they carried him and they put him in a borrowed tomb. And ladies and gentlemen and young people right here, among other things, is what separates Christianity from every other single religion on the face of the earth. For if you were to go to the place where they put the body of Jesus, you wouldn't find him. He's not there. On the third day, he got up from the grave, victorious over sin, victorious over death, victorious over hell. And today, God's son is alive. That's the good news. This is the great news. He wants to come and live in your life. You say, Tim, how, how does that happen? How does God's son come and live in my life? You come to this place. Now, I'm not talking about the geographical location of Maggie Valley, North Carolina. I'm not talking about this building here at Calvary Road. I'm talking about this moment. This moment and time and place in your life right now. To understand that in the sight of this holy God that you're a sinner. The Bible says so. The Bible says we've all sinned. And come short of God's glory. I've sinned. Pastor John has sinned. We've all sinned. Every one of us are sinners. And it's our sin that separates us from God. It's our sin that keeps us from having a right relationship with God. And it is our sin that would separate us from God for all eternity in a horrible place called hell. Except for the fact that a price was paid for our sins. God, only son, paid the price. God loved you so much that he gave his son to die for your sins, to die for my sins. And ladies and gentlemen, it would not have been enough for him just to have died. A lot of great religious leaders have lived and died and died martyrs' death. But see, Jesus didn't stay dead. He arose from the grave three days later. And today, if you're willing to repent of your sin, if you're willing to turn from your sin and turn to Jesus, the very moment that you, by faith, say yes to Jesus, you become God's child forever. What are you saying yes to? You're saying yes to the cross, to the blood that was shed for the death of God's only son, and then you're saying yes to that empty tomb. Friend, listen to me. I'm not talking about being a Baptist. This wonderful, precious Baptist pastor sitting here will be the first person in this room to tell you today that joining a Baptist church will not take you to heaven. It's not about being a Baptist or a Methodist or Lutheran or Church of Christ, Assembly of God, a Catholic, a Mormon, any other religion, any other denomination. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus. And you can leave here today with that relationship. Wouldn't you like to know that when you die, you would spend eternity with God forever? You say, well, Tim, I'm not planning on dying anytime soon, and I don't imagine any of us are planning it. But I tell people all the time, you don't have to go to heaven, and you don't have to go to hell. 
but you can't stay here. You're going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. And it all depends upon what you do with Jesus. Today could be the greatest day of your life. Would you bow your heads? I'm going to ask that no one move, no counselors, no pastors, no personal workers. The only ones that are moving are the ones that's going to come and sing and play. For our invitation, if you would move very quietly and very reverently, I want you to bow your heads and just draw an imaginary circle around yourself in your mind. No one to the right, no one to the left, just you and me and God. I'm going to ask you something today, and friend, no one's going to embarrass you. Don't, don't play just yet. Hold on just a moment, please. I'll give you instruction in a moment when to play. Our heads are bowed. I want everyone to hear this very carefully. Nobody's going to intimidate you. No one's going to embarrass you. But I want you to be honest. Don't raise your hand because you've always raised it. Don't raise your hand because someone around you raises theirs. How many in this room today would say, Tim, I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, if I were to die in the next four minutes in this seat where I'm at, if EMT was to come in this room and officially pronounce me dead, I know I would go to heaven. Tim, I remember the day when conviction came to my life. And I too repented of my sin and received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've been saved. And Tim, I'm not the least bit ashamed of it. No one looking but me and God. Let me see your hands today as a way of testimony. Just hold them up high. What a sight. What a beautiful sight. Hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of hands. You can take them down. Christian friend, don't ever be ashamed or embarrassed for a preacher to ask you that question and for you to give testimony. There were some today. Matter of fact, there were several today who could not raise their hands. And I want to tell you today that I appreciate you being honest. You could have put your hand up when others raised theirs, but you didn't do that. And in just a moment, I want you to let me pray for you. But before I do that, how many of those of you that just now raised your hand would say, Tim, I know I'm saved. I know I'm a Christian. But I also know there's some things in my own life that are not right with God. There's some things in my own life the Lord is not pleased with. And Tim, God spoke to me today. I don't want to run. I don't want to rebel. Pray for me that I can have these things right between me and God. Let me see your hands today. Hold them up high. Scores and scores and scores and scores of hands. You can take them down. I'm going to give the invitation today that I give somewhere across America nearly every Sunday of the year. Last Sunday in Georgia, maybe 6,000, sometimes 10 or 12,000, sometimes 150 or less. In a moment, listen to this, in a moment, we're going to sing one verse of invitation. We might sing two, but that will be all. And I'm going to ask every one of you that just now raised your hand, if you were serious, if you were not playing games with God, that when we sing, not yet, today will be different than you're used to. That's why sometimes we have evangelists come. It's not that they do it better. Sometimes they just do it a little different. We shake things up a little bit. So at a moment, when we sing, we're going to ask all of you that just now raised your hand to leave your seat, go to the nearest aisle, and then I want you to come and stand in front of me here today. Many times we kneel. But today I'm going to ask you to cooperate with me and come and stand in front of me, facing me. We're going to pray together. God is going to do something in your life. If you're afraid to come to yourself, ask someone to come with you. If someone is in your way, then you nudge them. They'll move over. They may be wanting to come as well. But today is your day to get things right between you and God. Hey, I wonder if there are those today who say, Tim, I've been saved, but I've not been baptized since I was saved. Maybe you got saved at camp. Maybe you've been saved in a revival. Maybe you got saved in your home or even last Sunday, but you've not been baptized since you were saved. Tim, I know I need to be baptized. I know God commands that in his word. Pray for me about this important commitment of baptism. Let me see your hand today. Hold it up high. Hold it up high. You can take them down. Let's make this a day of decision. Make this a day of commitment. They'll baptize you next Sunday. You want your family and friends to be here to watch it, but you need to come today and make the commitment. If you'll come, I'll help you do that. I wonder if those, there are those who would say, Tim, I'm not a member of Calvary Road, but I'm looking for a church home. I'm looking for a place to call family. Maybe you represent your whole family or just you as an individual. 
and you say, Tim, pray for me about this important commitment of church membership, the way this church accepts members. Let me see your hands today. Would you hold them up high? There's one family. There's two families. Are there others? Just hold them up high. Make sure that I see them. You can. There's three families. There's four families represented by adults raising their hands. You can take them down. Wow. Hey, folks, this is a good church. This is a pastor and a people that will love you and encourage you and bless you and help you. And it will be a church that you'll be a blessing to. And every week you be, wait to become a part of this exciting fellowship is a week you could have been, been doing what God wanted you to do right here. Let's make this a day of decision. When we sing in a moment, if you'll come and stand here, I'll help you to make that decision as well. Now while our heads are bowed, the most important question, where will you spend eternity? Friend, listen to me. Again, no one's going to embarrass you. No one's going to intimidate you at all. But do you care enough about yourself and where you're going to spend eternity to let this evangelist pray for you here today? There's nobody looking but me and God. I'm going to ask no one in the choir, no one on the platform, no one in the back. Just me and God. How many in this building today would say, Tim, the truth of the matter is, I'm not 100% for sure that if I were to die right now, that I would go to heaven. I could not raise my hand a while ago when all those other people raised theirs. Or I did raise my hand, but Tim's... Truthfully, I'm still not 100% for sure that if I died, I would go to heaven. And I certainly don't want to go to hell. And Tim, I want you to include me in that prayer. No one looking. Include me in that prayer. Let me see your hands right now all over this building. You and 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 you. Wow. And you. You can take them down. And you. God bless you. Numbers and numbers of hands. Anyone else? Dad, mom, teenager, young person. Tim, include me in that prayer too. Are there others? If you raised your hand once, you don't need to do it again. Are there others? Make sure I see it, and then you can take it back down. Those of you that raised your hand, listen to me. This could be the greatest day of your life. There's going to be a lot of people coming and standing here. Christians, I'm asking you to set the example. Counselors, personal workers, pastors, when the people come, I want you to come and stand here with them. Please don't stand over to the side. Come and stand right next to them. But I don't want you to talk to anyone. I don't even want you to pray with anyone. I just want you to come and stand as moral support until I pray and give instruction. You'll understand why in just a few moments. Remember, one verse, maybe two. From the top, it'll take you longer. From the back, the sides, it'll take you a little longer. We'll wait. But God has spoken to your heart. Take someone by the hand. You, on that very first word, begin to come and stand as close as you can right here. Would you stand to your feet all over the building? Everyone standing. My brother begins to sing. You begin to come. Come on, right now. If you were serious, just begin to sing, brother. Come on. If you were serious, right now, right here. Just come as close as you can right here. Come on, folks, mom and dad, teenagers, if you were serious. If you were serious, this is your invitation. Come on, dad. Come on, mom. Come on, teenager, young person. Just come in as close as you can. Make room for these others that are coming. Come on, folks. Come on down front here. Oh, Lamb of God, I come. Folks, come on in a little close if you will. Numbers and numbers and numbers of others are coming. This is your invitation. One more verse is, is all we're singing. This is it. Come on. God's speaking to your heart. God's dealing with your life. There are numbers of hands raised earlier. Step out of that seat and say, I'm going to go with God. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what my friends think. I'm going to go with God. There's another one coming, and another one coming, and another one coming. Others are coming, and another one is coming. This is your day. This is your invitation. Come on, Dad. Come on, Mom. Come on, young adult, teenager. Oh, Lamb of God, I come. 
our heads are bowed and Christians are praying. There are others that are still coming. A couple coming. God bless you, friend. Others, we're not singing anymore. I keep my word. But there's still time. In my heart, I believe there's 20 or 30 others that wanted to come. I know some of those rows are long. You're going to have to say excuse me to 10 or 12 people. But they may be wanting to come too. And I wouldn't let anything keep me from doing what God wanted me to do here today. There are two vital parts to this invitation. We're going to deal with the absolute most important part first. If you have never been saved, if your life has never, ever been changed by the power of God, remember, we're not talking about being a member of a church. We're not talking about being baptized. We're not talking about living a good, clean, moral life. We're talking about a day when conviction, real conviction came. You realized you were a sinner and that if you died like you were, that you would have spent eternity separated from God in a horrible place called hell. If you've never had that experience of Jesus Christ has never come to live in your life, then this is your day. In a moment, I'm going to pray out loud what we oftentimes refer to as a sinner's prayer. It's a prayer similar to what we prayed when we invited Jesus into our life. And if you want to be saved today, you're not playing church, you're not playing games with God, here at the front or even there in your seat, then when I pray this prayer out loud, I want you to pray it in your heart. Understand before you pray with me that the prayer itself will not save you. It's not coming here on Sunday repeating religious words after the evangelist, but you're coming to this place in your life to confess that you're a sinner. Knowing you cannot save yourself, you're turning to the one who died for you and the one who arose from the grave, Jesus Christ. And so today when I pray this prayer out loud, if you want to be saved and you're serious, then I want you to pray the prayer after me. It doesn't have to be these exact words, but something like this. And mean it with your whole heart as best you know how. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know my sins can separate me from you forever. But today, I want to be saved. God, please forgive me of all my sins. Wash me as white as snow. Make me your child. Right now, this very moment, I am trusting Jesus Christ and him alone as my Lord and my Savior. Take me to heaven when I die, for I am now your child. Our heads are still bowed. No one's looking but myself, the pastors, and the Lord. That's all. If you just now prayed that prayer in your heart, here at the front or there in your seat, if you prayed that prayer today and you meant it with your whole heart, as best you know, Tim, when you prayed that prayer out loud, I prayed it today in my heart as well. No one else look at Tim. I prayed that prayer. Let me see your hands. Hold them up high. Hold them up high. Hold them up high. Hold them up high. Don't take them down. There's one. There's two, there's three, there's four. They keep them up, please. There's five, there's six, there's seven. Keep them up. Don't take them down. There's eight, there's nine, there's ten, there's eleven. Don't take them down. There's twelve. Keep them up for another moment. There's thirteen. Keep them up for just one more moment. Just one more moment. Wow. You can take them down. Church, if you're rejoicing in 13 adults, and young people saying yes to Jesus today, would you give them a great big hand and tell them you're happy for them? <laughs> Woo! I, I, don't want, I don't want anybody else to look, just those 13, nobody else, just those 13 look right up here at me. Right over here, there's this bunch right over here, several back through here, right back through here, right back through here, right back there, up in the balcony there, and right over here and over here. Now, I can't keep looking at you, but I want all 13 of you to keep looking right up here at me. That is the most important prayer you will ever pray in your entire life. On Sunday, June the 23rd, at exactly 12 noon, I'm going by my watch, you said yes to Jesus Christ. I want you to remember that on 
June the 23rd, 2019 at 12 noon, what did you say yes to? You said yes to the cross and you said yes to that empty tomb. And when you by faith said yes to Jesus, you became God's child forever. You got to hear what I'm about to tell you. Every sin that you've ever committed in your life is gone. God doesn't just forgive us our sins. He forgets them. They're washed away. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do we overcome the accuser? By the blood of the Lamb. Your sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb. And listen to this. Now all 13 of you have a story. All 13 of you have a testimony. If you live 24 hours or 24 years or more, you're going to get to put some good stuff on your dash. You're going to get to put some good stuff and, and have a testimony. And here's what I want you to do. And I've asked literally thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people to do what I'm going to ask you to do right now. When you get back to your seat in a moment, I want you to find a piece of paper. It really doesn't even matter what kind of paper it is. I don't care. But big enough paper to write your name and your address and your phone number and an email if you have an email. And then I want you to write one word, saved, S-A-V-E-D. I love that word. For the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When we're, the pastor's going to come in a few moments and receive an offering for our ministry, and then I'm going to come and make a brief announcement, and then I'm going to go out by the fireplace by our table. I want all 13 of you to bring that piece of paper to me. Pastors, if we have any free literature that we would normally give people when they say yes to Christ, if somebody will have that back there by the time I get to the table, it'll help me, and we'll give it to these folks. But I want all 13 of you to do that. Is this important, Tim? It's vital. Why? Because it's the only way we know who you are, how to pray for you and encourage you and to help you get started in your Christian life. You can bow your heads back down. The invitation is not quite over. If you raise your hand today about baptism or church membership and you want to make that commitment of baptism or church membership, hold your hand up today. Make sure I see it. I want to give you instructions. Baptism right here. Are the others? Church membership, baptism. All right, I want you folks to do the same thing. You can take a hand. Find a piece of paper, name, address, form. I'm going to make sure Pastor John gets these papers, but let's just keep continuity, everything going the same direction. Bring it back to the table. Just write baptism, church membership with all that other information and bring it back to me. I'll rejoice with you as well. Now there's one other part of this invitation that's very important. I know what's going on. You know, and I've, I've been preaching evangelism for a long time and it gets 12 noon. Some people think that's a magical number, man. The Methodists are going to beat us to the cafeteria and we're not going to have any food left, but we're not any of us starving and so this is, as far as I'm concerned, the most important thing going on in the state of North Carolina right now. There are a whole lot of people today who said, I know I'm saved, but there's things in my life that are not right with God. I've seen grown men at this altar today with tears and grown women broken before God, and they're going to get to leave here today singing victory in Jesus, knowing everything's right between them and God. Friend, here's the deal. If you're saved but you're not right with God, this is the day, this is the time. And here's how you do that. The Bible says that if we will confess our sins, that He, God, is faithful to forgive us our sin. Isn't that a great deal? We confess and God forgives. But there's no play in church. There's no playing games. You don't pray one of these broad general prayers, Lord, if I've sinned. It's not that, John. It's Lord, I have sinned. And I've come to confess my sin. I want to leave here right with God. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts. Thank you for at least 13 today who said yes to Jesus. Their lives will never, ever be the same. And then, Lord, for those these that said they want to become a part of this church by baptism, church membership. And then, Lord, for a ton of people today who said, I just want to be right with God. Lord, I pray you would restore the joy, give back the victory, and even start a revival fire burning in their heart and in their life. May this be a day they begin to say, 
I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to have a story. I'm going to have a testimony. I'm going to make my life count for God the rest of the days of my life. So, Lord, I want to thank you for what you've done. And I want to thank you for the victories that's been won. In Jesus' name I pray. And amen. Would you give these folks a big hand? Let them make their way back to their seat this morning. Let's give the Lord a big hand in the house of God here today. Woo. You may be seated. Well, thanks for being with us in worship today. It is our heart's desire that through the word and through this worship service today, God has spoken to your heart and you desire to serve him and to worship him more than you ever have in your life. You know, if you've been watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is our greatest desire. If we can be a help to you, if we can uh, assist you in any way, please contact us at the information you see on the screen. We also want to thank those of you who watch us regularly. We greatly appreciate your prayer and support. Keep praying for us as we pray for you as we serve the Lord together.